So, hello everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, my name is Babis. I work for AWS, uh, in particular in the Fire Tracker team. Uh, and the talk today uh, is about snapshot safety and work that we and the community has been doing in order to try to restore uniqueness in virtual machine snapshots, virtual machine clones. And that doesn't work, or it does. Okay, yeah, that's right. So I'd like to start by actually defining the problem. So I'd like to speak about what do we mean by restoring uniqueness in snapshots? What is the uniqueness that we are uh, referring to in particular? And why, it's not, why do we lose it? Why do we need to restore it in the first place? And let's think about a simple example where you have a virtual machine that it runs on top of some hypervisor. And inside that machine, the address, in the address space of that machine, you have some data, uh, some state that for the purposes of your application, it has to be unique. It cannot be replicated. Otherwise, it doesn't work. Okay. And now suddenly you decide to take a snapshot of that virtual machine. And you might want to do that because you want a backup of that VM or because you run a service inside the, that VM and you want to scale out or because you want to have a snapshot from which in the future you can spawn VMs very fast in order to avoid uh, long latency in, in cold boots. And then in fact, you take that snapshot, you start another VM or more of them. And suddenly the, that property that you wanted at the very beginning that the, this object is unique, it doesn't hold anymore. Uh, every single VM that was booted from that snapshot has a copy of that, of, of that object. And why is that a problem? Uh, so imagine, for example, that uh, it, with every new VM that we spawned before, the state of the random number generator of, of the initial virtual machine has been duplicated. So now applications that get random bits from that random number generator, they're gonna get the exact same random bits in every single clone of that VM, at least when, uh, until when uh, a new reseed event is coming, you have new entropy. And that is true for kernel space random number generators or user space as well, like uh, the ones implemented using libraries like OpenSSL or language runtimes that implement their own random number generators like Java. And, but the problem is more general. It's not about random number generators only. It's about any kind of application that uses some data that it considers unique. So for example, you have a service that uses a certificate to identify itself with the outer world, and that gets snapshotted, restored in many other VMs, and now the service in every one of those VMs uh, identify, tries to identify themselves with, with the, using that certificate. Uh, and any other example like that, like uh, you have an application that writes, uh, tries to write something in a database using uh, an index that it considers to be unique, and suddenly that is not unique, so you have many applications trying to write in that database using the same index, and this can cause a lot of problems, obviously. So uh, this is a real-world problem. It, uh, it becomes more and more relevant, especially as we see VMs being used uh, uh, increasingly in the cloud in order to isolate workloads. It does affect both kernel and user space. And uh, we believe that there is a need for a generic solution, uh, system-wide solution, and instead of having uh, ad hoc solutions implemented in various systems separately. So then the next of the presentation, I want to speak about the current Linux landscape. What mechanisms do we have today to mitigate the issue? Then I would like to focus a bit more in user space applications do, to see what kind of mechanisms do we provide to those, if any, to, to protect themselves against the problem. And finally, I'd like to take a more wider look in, into the problem to look at it from a, from a system-wide perspective. So uh, the main, if not only, mechanism that exists today to that tries to mitigate the problem. It's called Virtual Machine Generation ID, and it's an emulated device that was introduced from Microsoft more than 10 years ago, I think, uh, exactly to solve this problem. So what, what the way this works is that it exposes a generation ID inside the guest. That generation ID is a cryptographically random 16-bytes uh, integer. 
and that integer, the value of that integer changes every time the machine executes from a, a different configuration uh, as per the specification. Essentially what that means is that every time you take a snapshot of the VM or you start a new VM from a snapshot file, that value should change. And that should let the, the guest know that something happened, uh, something happened with the VM. So the mechanism works one as a notification for VM lifecycle events, and two, the value itself being a cryptographically number, a random number, it can be used as a source of entropy for uh, inside the guest. Yeah, and it is defined as an ACPI device. So uh, Linux uh, recently implemented upstream support in the main line uh, for, for VM Gen ID. Uh, as an ACPI driver that maps the generation ID in the in kernel memory space uh, and handling ACPI notifications, which they arrive every time the generation ID changes. Essentially, the way this works is that at some point, uh, the hypervisor receive, receives a, a command to do something with the VM, take a snapshot or restore from a snapshot. And at that point, the VM is paused. The vCPUs are not running. The hypervisor updates the value of the generation ID injects inside the guest the ACPI notification and resumes this, the vCPUs. Now the kernel at some point will handle the, that ACPI notification. Uh, it will read the new value of the generation ID. And if that is not the same as the old one, it's going to use the new value to reseed it, to reseed its internal random number generator. It's going to use it as randomness. And that has the effect that applications that call now get random to get some random bits from from the rng they they can feel sure that uh, other clones of that vm that has started from the same the same snapshot are not going to receive the exact same random bit so the unpredictability of the random number generator is preserved uh, a very important note here is that this whole workflow that i described it does include a small raise window which uh, it is there because of the asynchronous nature of handling ACPI notifications. Essentially, what that means is that if an application calls get random before the kernel handles the notification, it's going to receive uh, random data using the old state of the RNG. But the implementation so far uh, assumed that this window is very, very small, so and it was the best thing we could do at the moment, probably, or at least it was considered to be. Uh, apart from that, there is the, the question of user space random number generators. They have the exact same problem as the kernel implementation, but in all, in, but the virtual machine generation ID does not provide by itself uh, any mechanism in order to let the user space know that ha something happened with a virtual machine. So another application that uses a user space uh, PRNG, it's, it's going to continue to get the same uh, random bits as every other clone of that VM that exists and has started from the same snapshot again un uh, at, uh, at, until new randomness uh, arrives in, the, in those RNGs. So that, that's the whole, the main point of this uh, discussion here. We were trying to see what we can do for the user space, what, what kind of mechanisms we, could, we can expose. So the concerns that we have about the, uh, today about the VM Gen ID itself is that first, it does not provide us in Linux with any mechanism for the user space. Second, the generation ID itself, it's consumed from in, inside the kernel in order to provide entropy for its PRNG. So it has been thought, it, it was thought that it, probably it's a security concern to expose it to user space as well. And of course the race condition we spoke about. And there has been many discussions on uh, with the community trying to, to address those issues. And one of those uh, one of those discussions follows uh, the line of integrating in the specification, extending the specification in order to add an extra variable, an extra uh, value, which is called the generation counter, uh, which is a word size counter. And its semantics is that it increases every time the value of the generation ID changes, okay? Now, this is not a source of entropy, so there are no concerns about exposing it to the user space. And the way that uh, 
uh, it has been foreseen to be used by the user space applications is by um, uh, it provides in order to be used by user space applications it provides an mmap and a poll interface also it has the additional uh, value that it is word size so it can be read with a single instruction in any given architecture so going back to our previous example the way that user space prng could use the the, the generation counter is that it could map it into its into its address space cache it and every time random bits are requested by it it could go back to the generation counter read it and compare it with the value it has cached if they are the same everything is fine but if uh, not it means that something has gone with, has happened with the vm so it needs to uh, update its state it needs to reseed itself somehow probably by calling get random from the kernel or with some sort of uh, entropy uh, other applications could use the poll interface uh, if they have threads and event loops they could use the poll interface to register uh, to wait for events for changes in this generation counter to come uh, so they know that something has happened and they're going to update themselves but as i said this is an open discussion there are uh, questions to be answered and the community is looking into alternatives as well uh, trying to find the, the perfect the, not the perfect the best uh, api possible for user space one of the questions that uh, has come up is that it is true that the generation id is used for entropy inside the kernel but uh, it is not clear that that it's actually harmful to uh, expose it to the user space uh, in the sense the, the rationale here is that it is secret to that vm it is not replicated to any other vm so maybe exposing it to the user space as a source of entropy for user space random number generators maybe it's not okay maybe it's not that, that big of a problem of course there is no answer here and if you have opinions i'm glad to hear them uh, so but if we could do that uh, and doing that we could actually use the generation id as well inside the kernel the same way we would use the generation counter in order to avoid the race condition in the kernel the here the the flow would go that instead of waiting for the acpi notification the implementation of the kernel rng would cache the generation id and every time get random is called it would read again the value and if those do not match it means that a vm event has happened and we need to do something we, we can use uh, the, the new generation id to to receive the kernel uh, rng also the fact that uh, word size uh, reads are faster it's true but there have been benchmarks that show that the the difference uh, it's of something very very small so probably for uh, real world uh, use cases reading 16 bytes maybe it's not a problem after all so another idea would be here to just uh, expose the virtual machine generation id towards the user space directly without having to extend the specification uh, at all of course before doing that we do need to clarify if that is a security concern in the first place okay uh, now let's let's assume that we do have a mechanism for to for the user space in order to be notified about events with the vm uh, and let's see if that actually solves the, the problem so again going back to the previous example we have an application that goes get random from the kernel uh, random number generator the vm here it has support for vm gen id the kernel uses that in order to make sure the rng the kernel rng works fine okay and the application gets some random data and it uses it internally to create some other object and at that point it receives a snapshot request now we are in a situation where the data we receive from the kernel sprng is fine we in the sense fine here uh, has a definition I, we used before we are sure that other clones of that vm have not returned the deterministically the same exact random bits okay but that object that we created in the application uh, in the application before has now been is now part of the snapshot that we took and uh, new vms are going to include it and of course this is not a problem uh, only of it's not an rng specific problem uh, any other application that does something at that point is going to get its state uh, in the snapshot and even if it has an, a mechanism from the kernel 
to figure out that something has happened, think about the scenario where it is actually in the process of writing in a database somewhere remotely, and that operation is in flight. There is nothing we can do. Like uh, there is nothing we can do to predict that uh, this would have happened. So there are there is an in-flight operation uh, outside the VM. So that makes us think that VM Gen ID is is a great tool for allowing us to detect world changes, but probably it's not enough. If we wanted to validate that uh, our state hasn't changed, we should do it in every level of the application. So we would go. We would need to go and patch every application out there to to do, to validate a value, uh, the value of VM Gen ID or Gen Counter or whatever, or in, in every operation it does, in every transaction it does. And even if we did so, there is nothing we can do about operations that are already in flight. And that is because VM Gen ID like mechanisms are post mortem. They allow us to react to events such as take a snapshot or restore a VM from a snapshot. And probably we should be thinking about stuff that we could do before this event even happens. So essentially the problem arises from the fact that uh, VM events arrive at arbitrary, arbitrary points in time in which we have no control. And another thing that it seems to be relevant here is that the problem is uh, particularly relevant when we are uh, when our VMs are networked, they, they communicate with the outer world. If they were, if they weren't, they were in a silo, then any sort of secrets would be there and they would not uh, interact with anybody else outside the VM. So following these observations, one potential solution would be to control the timing of snapshot VMs. We should only try to uh, perform these events when it is safe to do so. So for example, when we are not communicating with the outer world and when we are restoring from a snapshot, we should allow applications to readjust themselves before we uh, consider that the VM is safe to operate uh, normally. For example, we start the, win the network. So, and this is the systemd part of the presentation. Uh, so we try to model this in system D and th that was work that happened like a year ago, more or less. We do that by defining the, the state of the, uh, defining four states for the VM. When, when the VM is running, uh, it's business as usual. Everything runs normally, nothing has happened. Now, when you want to transition to a state that is safe to take a snapshot, that is the quiescing state of the VM. Uh, once you have reached that state, uh, you are in the quiet state. And at that point, it is okay to take a snapshot of the VM. Yeah, sure. Sorry. With regards to uh, safety, um, you know, in the quiescing and quiet state, um, the, would that require some kind of a user agent? Uh, for example, you know, if you have uh, your file system, you could be snapshotting in an unclear file system state between the snapshot and your parent. Uh -huh. um, is there um, any mechanism to prevent that? Would some kind of a user space or I guess in kernel tell you when are the, from the IO point of view, is it safe to snapshot the file system? So yes, the, the idea here is that uh, uh, transitioning from, uh, we wanted to essentially reuse an idea that is already, mechanisms that are already in system D, which are inhibitor locks and an application that would need to do something before taking a snapshot, uh, it would uh, get an inhibitor lock and would, would uh, not let the system go into a quiet state uh, until it does whatever it needs to do in order to mark itself as safe for snapshots. When you, when you say the application, um, are you talking about the user space queue and process? Or? Any service, yeah. Okay. So why isn't this like you realize that this is what you want is similar to system control suspend, but why isn't it identical to system control suspend? Like why not uh, send basically the equivalent of a ACPI 
suspend button pressed event to the VM, then the system suspends because there's already hooks and all the networking stuff um, to uh, when you come back from a um, suspend to re-request a DHCP because your machine might have moved and things like that. So, um, I mean, I think it's unrealistic to get uh, large amounts of user space software to adapt to a new concept, but my question is the existing suspend concept, isn't that exactly what you need already? Well, I think it, that's a discussion we could have. Uh, I think you, you, we were discussing, you were part of the discussions last year, right? Uh, yeah, but I forgot all of them. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, Alex, do you have any comment on why we cannot use system CTL suspend? Awesome. Um, in, in a nutshell, it's a great idea. Um, the, the, the main okay. The main the main reason why um, we didn't do it is because the current interface doesn't have it. There is just no ACPI event. There's nothing we can uh, officially inject into the guest to say, please go into into a safe state that isn't an S3 or something. We we we, we only have we only have a, actual ACPI snapshot states. Uh, like 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 uh, suspend suspend states. We have S three and S four. Yeah, you just a second. Uh, 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 well, I mean, there is certainly an ACPI event to ask for a system suspend, which is traditionally bound to the sleep key of your laptop, right? Correct. You, you could send that thing, and then what happens is what uh, system you makes of it, and uh, you you have these many sleep modes in the kernel. You could just add a new one, and I mean, nothing is hard coded to S three there. Could just add a new one, and then if that's the only one that's available, then we just use that one. And then in the kernel, you just do basically nothing. Um, yeah, yeah, totally doable. I agree. Um, just the driver. It's just well, and also also that's that's just, that's no precedent, but I think the idea is absolutely sound. I think that to to invoke that path to say, um, hey, we we do want to go into a um, a state where we want to be safe now. Please shut down in quotes. So that we can then suspend you. I think doing an ACPI event from the outside and just acting on it based on typical I mean, existing logic for suspend is, is exactly the right thing to do. What we do need to make sure of is that um, on on resume, if we're going through the typical suspend path, it's on resume. You still need to enlighten all user space to then go and check whether your generation changed, because you don't want to always reseed every and the number whatever path. On every time you go in from 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 suspend, suspend resume, right? But I mean, like which like uh, like I mean, you list network manager, network team, things like that. Those all re refresh the DHCP releases when they come back from. They suspend. definitely do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, 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 Sam, but Sambo won't other. generate a new SID. <laughs> Don't use Sambo. <laughs> just just saying, like one example, one completely arbitrary Sounds example. Really, really weird to <laughs> duplicate Samba in the millions on AWS or something. <laughs> It's, it's a generic problem you want to solve generically, right? So you, you need to be able to um, to create some mechanism that allows you to regenerate your UIDs but, that otherwise would not. Sure, but it, it sounds like as if uh, the suspend stuff um, is kind of what, what you no, want, but then you probably right. should also check. Um, I mean, we because we tell you when we go down and we tell you when we come up, and okay. then if you if Samba would then also look at the VM gen ID, then exactly. you already have done. Exactly, then you have it. Or, or, or. Or you need more hooks, like on resume, you have some script which will poke Samba and force it to do stuff Correct. such that yeah. you need more hooks. Yeah. So do you expect things like networking to change, like the NIC and the MAC address and stuff to change over the transition? Or are you going to do that at some other point? I'm not sure I got it. Uh, when you resume a new VM, yeah. will it MAC change? Uh, I think so. it should. Right? I think. I mean, this probably depends on what people want. But in in, in system, do we we already have this way, how we hash the MAC address for you from some other seed thing, and uh, so we probably could uh, extend that that uh, when you choose to do this, um, that we also include the VM Gen ID in the hash as as, as input, and then basically, um, yeah, when. We come back. We not only re-request the DHCP release, but also update the the thing fully automatically. If you follow what I mean, but yeah, Ch changing the MAC address on the fly on suspend resume is not going to be trivial because your device model ideally shouldn't change between a suspend and uh, like a, between e both suspend and resume from from S3 as well as for normal snapshots. So that one's slightly tricky to change the MAC address between the two. Um, doable, but probably needs driver changes or at least that. adaptions. You do that. <laughs> I know. 
Uh, can, can I jump in here for a sec? Uh, so, I, I mean, as you go through this and all the various examples, well, MAC address needs to respond one way, like uh, cryptographic keys need to respond another way. You see that like each, each situation is sort of case by case on what the semantics should be. If you need it to be stable, if you need it to be unique, right. if it represents a compromise or if it's just a refreshing it is like the RNG receives itself every two minutes, uh, but wasn't necessarily compromised, whereas we assume on a VM fork, it is a compromise. So you have all these things that are case by case, but that, that all kind of makes me wonder about the motivation for jumping from uh, what you describe as the post-mortem checking to the system-wide snapshot safety, where um, that you, you gave this example of the transaction that's in progress and what do you do with that? And so, like, if we start with a user space RNG and say it's using some fancy thing with the VM gen ID, but then as soon as the number leaves the RNG and it's on its way to the consumer, say there's a fork there. Well, then the whole thing kind of breaks. Yeah. Like, then both forks are going to get the same number. Um, but if you start to consider this in the context, like, are you doing crypto or a MAC address or whatever, um, now let's consider the crypto case where you want to avoid using the same nonce uh, with the same key, otherwise you get some kind of catastrophic key reuse. Um, but it turns out the solution here is that you check the VM gen ID uh, once before you do anything, uh, that is right before you generate your keys, and then just before you transmit onto the network. And okay. if you do it at those two places, you're fine, then you won't have nonce reuse. Right. And if something changes just after you've transmitted, then you've transmitted the same data in both cases, okay. So you, so you don't have a break. So it seems like for all of these, you wind up with these kind of case by case logic that belongs in an application on what yes. the right behavior should be. That trying to encapsulate it with some kind of system wide snapshot thing, the, all the problems rear their head again. All right, well, what do we do about MAC address? What do we do about crypto? I, I just I don't see what motivates the shift to wanting to do this in system D. Okay. It seems like you can do it's everything. None of it, but it's, it's, not, it's not a shift. It's not a shift, it's, a, it's an addition. So ideally you want to, able to, use to do, you want to be able to solve, for the normal snapshot restore case, you want to solve 99% of the cases by just having application logic that goes and identifies, hey, I'm, I'm in a new world right now, let me go and, and process um, things differently. Whatever way that different means, whether it means reseeding, whether it means uh, changing or renegotiating a current identifier, whatever that is. Um, where the system D pieces come in is imagine imagine a world where we no longer boot. We don't we don't boot anymore. Like every 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 Linux image you ever you ever run on on a virtual machine environment, always starts from a snapshot. Always. In that world, you you do have you always will have certain parts where your overall environment assumes uniqueness. Samba is just one case that com immediately comes to mind, but there's more pieces but here and there. Why can't you just do that post mortem where you check the VM gen ID just before you transmit and you make sure that's the same ID as at the time you generated your keys? And if it's different, then you go regenerate your keys. Oh, um, you, you want to, for example, be um, able to, to launch. Let me just give you a su super simple example. Um, SSH daemon. You want to be able to, to boot, boot a full Linux system that has an SSH daemon running. But after that snapshot, you, you kind of want to have a reseeded host key because that should be unique after for, for, a, for a different VM, right? So you want to be able to stop that SSH daemon before you go into this, 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 this um, synchronization state. And then once you come back up, regenerate the key or generate a completely new key uh, and only then start SSH daemon again, and then you can lock back in. Uh, but don't you get the same thing doing it post mortem too? You know, I, I, things change. Say you get an asynchronous so racy notification to generate the host you get, key. You get a, but, but in the meantime, if you have requests coming in, they just get dropped naturally. It won't get dropped. It will get. There's a there's a slim but existent chance that you will get an, a connection to a yeah, stale. Yeah, yeah. So, so what I'm suggesting is they get dropped anyway because the VM gen ID counter has changed. And uh, the counter is checked right before you transmit everything on the network. 
I really don't like the counter idea because I don't understand what prevents two VMs, two snapshots seeing unique counter values. <laughs> They don't have to. You don't care. The counter is just to tell you that something changed. Worked by uh, unique. Uh, sorry, a bit loud. So it's, uh, um, it's an edge notification, like uh, something. Yes, it's something just a change. Yeah, it's just to tell you something changed. Uh, this thing is okay. Um, the the one it's a little detailed, but the, you do need to ensure that. No, on your to your to your mouth. <laughs> okay, that uh, when you. Pass when the user space observes the counter changing mm -hmm. and does a get random that the kernel has also observed the counter changing, which in multiprocessor architecture with weak memory access models and whatnot and whatnot can need to be you know, ensured. And so you really want the PRNG to test after the fact. You can't rely on the SCPR notification at all in the kernel. The kernel PN, the get random must do a check of the generation ID after the fact before returning into user space. Yeah. Otherwise, you again get fantastic race where user space is a new counter, gets a new random number from except it's actually the old one. Yeah. As you say, you're you're right, the, the, the kernel must be postmortem. Uh the the reason it's not now is uh simply because the thing we have is 16 bytes and is annoying. Uh but sure we have, we add this counter then that kind of goes away. Uh, but I mean, if the kernel can do that, every piece of user space logic can do the same exact thing. Like you were talking about the SSH host key example, someone connects, you, you would basically just say you you're, you're, you're about to reply, but before you do, before you do, you send the results of any cryptographic operation, check to see if the counter has been incremented. If it has, drop it and don't send anything on the network. That, that is a, anything you can do here can be converted to so the So you're suggesting case. that we should patch uh, every, like SSH? The, the problem is you have a layering violation, right? Uh, you provide the host key to SSH, it doesn't know anything about that key suddenly no longer valid because some kind of change somewhere. You know what I mean? The, the, the host key comes from a file on a file system from an SSH config somewhere. It's not associated to a counter, it's not associated to anything. Uh, there is, it's, so you would have to build into SSH the concept of its configuration that it reads from disk is associated with some kind of counter. You know what I mean? There is a layering violation problem here that is between what's happening in the depth of SSH and all the data such as the host key that it obtained through file system, config files and whatnot, which need to change, right? So I mean, it's not all you, all so you... in principle, what you say is right, but in practice, how you actually implement that seems to me to be, quite tricky. But I mean, is it really that hard? Because everything you actually need to do is just exit, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that, that it gets restarted and can do its key stuff and everything else again, right? Like, so would it really be that hard to add to SSHD that uh, whenever it sends something on the network, does a quick check and if it's... Well, it, but I mean, uh, what I, I would really like to understand, right? Like, we're talking about pre-mortem and post-mortem, like, which are the use cases you have in mind for the pre-mortem stuff? Like, what is actually the use cases that need to run before? Because I mean, this is what systemd will give you is the pre-mortem stuff. So it's the free, correct, correct. Yeah. I agree. If you want to the network, right? Network is the big one. It's really just to shut down the network so that you don't you don't even start having or that you don't have any lindering connections at all anywhere in any of your system. So you would tell so on the system. You would tell so them you on actually the want that free. a TCP reset is sent out before you do this. Yes. Yeah. Okay. This is the, your answer. Then why this actually might make some sense. I'm sure if I agree with this. Well, you... right. Very apparently here on the uh, on the remote session, if I can just ask a question. Um, I'm a little, a little concerned that we're um, using two concepts on top of the VM gen ID that are perhaps mutually exclusive. But the, ori the original purpose of the VM gen ID stuff was to allow you to detect when a VM has been rolled back so that you can avoid reusing keys, for example. But in that scenario, you don't want to change your SSH host key. You don't want to change your MAC address. You don't want to change a whole bunch of other things. You want them to stay the same, but it's still the same VM. You just rolled it back to a previous point in time when you're trying to avoid reusing state. And that's quite different from using snapshots from the point of view of forking VMs, where you have now multiple VMs running from the same original source. 
So I'm, I'm just wondering how we distinguish between those two use cases, given we only have one mechanism, which is the VM gen ID that's trying to be pushed to handle both. Comment, I agree. I agree, completely agree. Um, I, uh, the, the simple answer is um, the big proposal we have on the, on the table right now is to just uh, extend VM Genity with a second counter. And we could literally just call it a uh, four counter. I think this question is still relevant, though. Uh, we want this counter anyway to be able to do this sort of a race free post mortem detection. Yes. But that's going to come up in the case when you roll back and the case when you fork. It doesn't have to come up in the case when you roll back. Why? That's that's a case when you definitely don't want to repeat the same uh, the same key stream. So like you want to renegotiate a client connection key rather than the host key. Right, exactly. I see. <laughs> I see. Ugh. So what would you do? Give it to okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm always looking at this from a system perspective again, yeah. like, and you said you want to do the TCP or reset first, but this sounds like a kernel question then, right? Like you could also just say, uh, uh, yeah, when you initiate the freeze, you just tell the kernel and the kernel just terminates all TCP connections and then that problem is solved, right? Like what do you actually need system to user space? Just bring the network down, you mean? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, don't call it bring the network down, just terminate all the ongoing transactions, all the TCP connections. Hey, we could do it in the hypervisor as well. Sorry. It's it's tricky because again, you, you want to re if you want to regenerate new keys and all of that, you have to put everything on hold for a certain amount of time while you're gonna rerun SSH key gen, where you're gonna so it it's not just resetting the connection and getting new connections. You actually have to reestablish new states. Uh, which is going to be a asynchronous process. It's going to take a certain amount of time. Uh, and during the, all that time, you don't want the network to start again. So it's, I can understand why going through that system, the process is, is appealing because you get all of that for free. Um, while uh, the low level, more low level approach that uh, you were proposing, I don't know, sorry, I don't know your name, um, before, uh, it's trickier because yes, it's instantaneous. You know that you may need to drop something, but you don't necessarily know or have the orchestration to synchronize with whatever mechanism of will regenerate all the keys and 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 will eventually tell you to restart. And even in SSG itself, it's not going to do it. So, uh, this is the point. This is basically the same point you made earlier about uh, SSH. All right, you drop the thing, but then get this layering violation, how does it know it's got to regenerate its keys? And uh, Leonard mentioned, well, you can just like exit and check on the error code or whatever. But uh, the other way is the initial thing I propose is you, you're you checking this synchronously with the counter to make sure you don't do something terrible cryptographically. But then you also have an asynchronous notifier via the pull mechanism that uh, when it gets things asynchronously that is racy, it's after the fact, but it doesn't matter because the race is handled by the synchronous thing, but then you have some daemon that shuts things down, generates new host keys, and does all the rest. But well, this thing is supposed to run pre-mortem before. But what I'm suggesting is you can do everything with just the VM Gen ID uh, situation where you have a file that you can mmap uh, if you want to do the synchronous thing where you're checking, or you can pull on that file to get some asynchronous notification. And so you could have some daemon that's always pulling on that, that gives you an asynchronous notification post mortem that it needs to set things up again. You would still need so okay. So let's take SSH as our example. So SSH you detect the change, you need to drop everything on the floor, and then you still need something somewhere that will then wait for that other mechanism before you restart because otherwise you're going to snapshot the new number without having created new keys or whatnot. So you, it's, it needs to be a one-off thing. It's like, it's a circuit breaker. So you, you, you must not allow SSH to restart operations until the new keys have been generated. So yes, you, you will detect the, the change and you will potentially quit SSH D or and whatever. So it's a circuit breaker. Your entire environment, your script, your init script, all of that needs to then Fundamentally, wait for this asynchronous event before restarting things. So you need a specific error code, for example. Or... It's simpler design. So for the synchronous checking, SSH's behavior there is just not to transmit things onto the network. 
maybe it quits, maybe it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't really matter, it just has to stop transmitting. Then you have your other daemon called, you know, restart VM stuff D. I think it's much easier than that. It's polling, Jason. and then that will, yeah, then that'll restart things and do whatever. Jason, I think it's much easier than that. It's, it's um, if you combine, um, if, if we basically conclude that, that conversation, right, what you're saying is um, we have two completely distinct cases. One is fork and reseed or re regenerate yourself. And the other one is fork and just drop your, like, like re regenerate your uniqueness, but don't, don't uh, actually regenerate things like host keys. And for the, 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 those two are policy questions that your administrator needs to do in one of those sequences, which can be a suspense sequence. So what you could do, and I think this is really what I'm, what I'm hearing from this conversation is, we should be building the, um, the VM Gen ID uh, second page interface that allows you to um, map in uh, asynchronous interface into user space, that allows you to create a poll interface to user space, all of that should be done, step one. Step two is, um, if we really just go and implement, say, even S3 of all, by all means, just, just basically go into the most normal suspend path and just have a simple hint somewhere, which could even be a file of all things, um, that says, once you're coming back up, regenerate yourself. We can just go through the existing uh, hooks that systemd already has when you, when you resume from a suspend and then just regenerate your keys because that is an admin in, inflicted uh, decision anyways. Sorry, folks, we're out of time. We need to give time to the next talk. So thank you very much thank to the speaker. Guys.